رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي امين يا رب. There are a couple of reasons I'm going to talk about this subject. This year in particular, I saw more than three or four marriages go through difficulties because of the issue of the in-laws. And as you know, the, the greatest reason for divorce, generally, is because of financial reasons. And, uh, but uh, dealing with the in-laws is one of those subjects that's not very much talked about, and it's hard to talk about it. And so I'm going to try to give some, some interesting remarks. Uh, dealing with in-laws, according to study cases that have been done by sociologists, psychologists, it's almost in 80% of the cases, uh, in general, in the world, in 80% of the cases, there is usually some sort of conflict between the wife and the mother-in-law. And there are psychological reasons of that, which I'll go into a little bit later. But this seems to be a very real conflict. And uh, it has uh, very uh, long-lasting implications. And I will also be talking about what those long-lasting applications and uh, effects are. But before I begin, I want to give really the gist of my entire talk and then the details there. So I started digging the books of the Fulqaha and our Islamic inheritance of knowledge, books on what does Islamic law have to say about in-laws. And also looking at the ahadith and uh, about the sayings of the Prophet and his seerah and so on and so forth. And when you take a survey of the entire tradition, you find very little things. And in fact, what you find is that there is a silence. There is a general silence on the whole issue. Yes, fuqaha have said things like, the mother-in-law cannot come into the house of the daughter-in-law and just start moving the furniture here and there. And uh, this is not proper. So some things like this have been written. But really an entire uh, understanding of the relationship with, with in-laws has never been discussed. So this was one thing that became very clear. And the second thing that became very clear, so I'm looking at our Islamic uh, law and I see nothing much there. And I'm looking at the ahadith of the Prophet wasallam, and I see nothing much there either. So it made me think, okay, what am I not seeing? Because everything has to be there. And what I realized is that as the Prophet married Fatima and married his other daughters, his policy was the policy of silence. Meaning he did not want to interfere into the marriage life of his daughters. That was his policy. Like the Prophet ﷺ said, مِنْ حُسْنِ الْإِسْلَامِ الْمَرْئِهِ ذَرْهُمْ بَلَا يَعْنِيهِ Amongst the good qualities of a mu'min is what? He doesn't concern himself with what doesn't concern him. And the Prophet ﷺ said, and this is what in-laws do have to take into consideration, is that the Prophet said, if there's a third party between two, between a husband and wife, some of these interfering in the marriage, he's what? A shaitan. So, both the in-laws, both the sides have the potential of being that shaitan. And I know a case very recently I just dealt with where the, the marriage was broken apart because of um, the marriage was broken apart because of the conflict between the daughter-in-law and the, and the mother. And uh, the, the son has to make a choice. Right? And uh, so this is something we have to be careful about. So what, one thing that our studies do show in, in psychology and uh, sociology is that the conflict between the in-laws is inevitable. Meaning it's going to happen. So that means that before the daughter goes into that house, in fact there's a book written uh, called uh, Six in One Bed, something of this nature. Meaning the husband and the wife and then the, the, the parents and then the two parents, six in one bed. And so the point uh, of this is that, um, that there is going to be a lot of things that are going on, especially as this girl comes into this house, uh, 
and generally, uh, let me just uh, mention, so what we can assume, and a wife should assume, because uh, that when I go into this house, there will be some conflict, right? Just like there would be in your own house, there's conflict. And so there's going to be a conflict in this. The only difference is, is that while closer relationships are more delicate, meaning, let's say, uh, a son and a mother, it's a more delicate relationship, but forgiveness also happens more often. And I'll talk about why, why this is important, because if something goes wrong with the daughter, if the daughter-in-law says something, or if the husband, the son says something to his parents, that my wife did this or my wife did that, he will forget two, three weeks later. But the mother-in-law, she will not forget. She will, she will continue to remember that uh, this is what was said about my husband's uh, wife. And so there are certain dynamics that I'm going to put together that will inshallah help us to uh, deal with these things. So, of course, as any topic, I have to discuss the basic things first and then I will go into the details. And that is that because you know there will be conflict, right? And many times in the Qur'an, even in the Qur'an, where Qur'an knows there's conflict, the Qur'an uses the word taqwa. Like, for example, in Surah Nisa, in fact, the ayat of nikah, the three, Ayat of Nikah. They are directly related to our interpersonal relationships. For example, so the Nisa is the first ayat of the Nikah, right? Ya yuhannas inna khalaqna kum min nafsin wa wa khalaqna minha zawjaha wa batha minhuma rijalan kathira wa nisa'a wa attaqullah alladhi tasa'aluna bihi wal arham. Have fear Allah for the relationships that you ask one another for. Right? Then in the same way you have Ya yuhalladhina amanu, Ya yuhalladhina amanu, um, yeah. Ya yuhalladhina amanu qulu qawlan sadida Say the right thing, all you people believe, say the right thing Yuslih lakum a'amalakum He will make your deeds right Meaning your relationships will become right Yuslih lakum a'amalakum wa yaghfir lakum dhunubakum Wa ma yuta'illah wa rasulahu faqad faza fawzan azimah In the same way in Surah Al-Imran, the third ayah of the nikah Ya yuhalladhina amanu attaqu allaha haqqa tuqadihi O people Oh, uh, oh you people who believe, fear Allah as He deserves to be feared. Now taqwa is a very, it means fear the, your actions. Fear your actions of what it will bring about, the result it will bring about. The fear of Allah is a different word. The fear of Allah is khashya. The fear of Allah is khashya. Taqwa is the fear of what your disastrous results of your actions will be. So uh, in this ayah, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu attaqu allaha haqqa tuqatihi wa la tabutunna illa wa antum muslimun and do not die except that you are Muslims. Then what does it say? Wa'atasimu bihabli allahi jami'an wa la tafarraku wa adhkuru ni'mat allahi idh kuntum a'adha'an fa'allafa bayna qulubikum. And remember the time where you were all enemies, right? Relationships, you were all enemies. فَأَلَّفَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِكُمْ And he brought all your hearts together. فَأَسْبَحْتُمْ بِنِعْمَةِ إِخْوَانَ And by his Grace, by Allah's grace, you found each other becoming like brothers. فَاسْبَحْتُمْ بِنِعْمَةِ إِخْوَانَ And so on and so forth. So, this word taqwa has come very often in regards to relationships. This was, why is this the case? Because, especially in this ayah, which is read in the nikah, the khutbah to nikah, وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ الَّذِي تَسَأَلُونَ بِهِ This is the, the relationships that you ask, Allah have taqwa. And the issue is like having sabr. Sabr wouldn't be needed if relationships would be perfect. Right? So relationships are needed when you, when you know that other people are bound to cross limits. Uh, other people are going to even cross what we can call healthy limits. And we will talk, we will see why this happens in dynamics of families. So things like, Right? Uh, Allah commands you to do justice and ihsan. Uh, and to who? To your relatives. Right? Because that's where it's most difficult. It's always easy to be nice to strangers and difficult to people you have relationships with. So, so by remembering that you have to have taqwa, and by remembering that you're going to your own grave, uh, and by remembering that you're answerable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what you can do is change your attitude, but you can't change anyone else. And the thing is, if you change your attitude, and this is a general advice in any interpersonal relationships, when you change yourself, then the other person has to change their attitude towards you. Right? If you're acting the same way, then they'll act the same way. But if you change yourself, right, instead of being, let's say, angry, if you are nice, then the others will have to also change the attitude uh, also. 
So the nature of uh, dealing with in-laws is, is universally known to be difficult. Um, and this is, there, there's, there's uh, a few factors for this. So let's understand the dynamics of this. Uh, and then uh, the first is that, especially in the Muslim world, what happens is couples don't fall in, in love until they're after married, until they're after you know, marriage. Uh, with non-Muslim couples, they may be in love before. But especially with Muslim dynamics, you don't, the parents at least don't see that love they have until they're after married. When that happens, there are two things that become difficult. Number one, it's difficult for the mother to let go. It's difficult for the mother to let go of the son. Okay. And the mother feels like, oh my God, my son's in love with this girl and he's going to just, you know, take her away and she feels this kind of like something that's hers, uh, something that she loves being snatched away from her. And at the same time, the, the wife is not ready to share her husband with the mother. She's not necessarily ready to share his, her husband with another wife, just like that. She's not ready to share uh, her husband with another woman, even if it may be the mother. And this is one thing that when uh, young Muslims get into marriage, they have to realize, meaning they have to be cognizant of this, that this dynamics will happen. That where the mother is going to test the waters, right? You know, where the, uh, I remember this sister that um, just recently told me, you know, my, 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 this is her impression of a situation that I was involved in not too long ago, where the daughter was saying to me that, you know, whenever me and my husband would be angry at each other, the mother-in-law, she would be happy. Or if, like, uh, uh, if I left, uh, the, uh, if I was sitting with my husband and my left, I left, my, my mother-in-law would come and sit. This is a classical example of how the mother is trying to, she feels she's losing control of her son and she, she wants to get back uh, that control. And at the same time, the wife doesn't like the fact that the mother wants that control. And so she is also reacting to that. And so, one, what, so what I wanted to mention is the, the gist of what I learned uh, while I was doing research from the perspective of Islamic tradition was that the Prophet ﷺ, the silence of him not getting involved in the marriages of Fatima and Ali and Uthman and Ruqayya and so on and so forth, you find him saying nothing. And the Prophet's policy as an in-law was that of silence. And I'll tell you the wisdom of that. Meaning the Prophet allowed Ali to come to him. Or he allowed Uthman to come to him. Rather than him going to them. And you'll see what, how this plays in the dynamics of things. And then we'll talk about other issues about like taking care of parents. Particularly, uh, I thought a lot about this in the modern context, uh, how that works. Uh, we will come to that, just let's take it one by one. So, now when uh, the in-laws uh, are getting married, when, when couples are getting married, conflict, again studies show, generally happens for two reasons. The first reason is that because the in-laws want to change the daughter-in-law. And the daughter-in-law doesn't want to change herself. So if from the very start, the mother-in-law gets the impression she's not going to listen to me. Or if the daughter-in-law gets the impression, oh, she's trying to change me. Then you are uh, headed in a, uh, in a uh, relationship that is going to be uh, kind of like uh, unstable in, in between the mother-in-law and the, uh, the daughter-in-law. Also, what, one of the statistics that I thought was very interesting, the first fights that ever happened between in-laws, uh, meaning the daughter-in-law and in, in, uh, the mother-in-law, usually happens in the kitchen. The first argument where, and maybe many of you, I don't know if this is applicable to all cultures and generations, but maybe the wife came from the kitchen where she was just talking to the mother-in-law and something, you know, some, so, um, so, the mother-in-law feels scared and the wife does not know how to share. So that's the one issue. And the other, so that's the first reason of the conflict, is the, the mother doesn't know how to let go and the, the wife does not want, does, she is jealous of the mother and the mother is jealous of the daughter internally. And the second is expectations. 
So the second reason is because mother-in-law has a different expectations and the daughter-in-law doesn't want to change to those expectations. And so that creates a conflict. Um, so when you read the Quran, uh, what you find, uh, when you read, for example, the Quran and the Ahadith, like the third party that is intervening between the husband and the wife and causing problems, uh, the Prophet calls them shaitan. And then the other parts of the Quran that uses the word fasad in general. And so on the one side, you, you, you understand that it is natural for conflict to happen, particularly in the case where there is a conflict, a natural conflict over the, over the son or the husband. Uh, on the other hand, when you read the Qur'an, you become kind of, you, when you read the Qur'an, you think, how, why would there be a conflict? You know, why would people want fasad? And uh, this shouldn't happen. And, and I can go over many verses, but I don't want to do that. I want to actually go into some of the interesting things. So here are some rules that I want to set out regarding uh, the relationship between the in-laws and so on and so forth. And then we're going to talk about a very significant problem, which is really the, one of the main issues I want to talk about, which has to do with, in today's world, when the, the son is responsible for taking care of the parents, but the son is working 24-7. He's working all the time. So he doesn't have time to take care of his parents. It's not like the olden days that I can, you know, uh, I, I, there's a guild, you know, a guild means like a union. This is how Muslims used to work. We used to have guilds. And you used to say, well, I'm going to work, you know, from, from Dhor to Asr, I'm working. And then after that, you can, you allocate your work according to your other schedules, not the other way around. Nowadays, what happens is, you look at your work schedule and then you allocate your life, right? So they would have, like in the Ottoman Empire, in the Abbasid Empire, what would happen is, people would have guilds. So let's say if they were uh, construction workers. So there is, let's say, 500 construction workers. And so they would have a communion together. And you know how the doctors have this oath? What is it called? The oath of... Uh, Medical ethics. Yeah, Hippocrates. Uh, the, the oath of... The Muslim used to have this in all of their professions, not just the medical field. So when you join the union, and generally it was like if my father is a shoemaker, then the ch his child will also be a shoemaker. And if he's a, a blacksmith, his child will also be a blacksmith. And so they used to take an oath and be part of this guild. And then they would allocate the resources. Okay, we need this house built, we need this house built, we need... And so they would say, oh, you only want to work four hours? Okay, why don't you go over here and, you know, put in your four hours. So people would fix their schedules, and then the guilds would look at the resources they have and allocate them according to that. This is how it was done in the Ottoman Empire and the, in the uh, Abbasid Empire. Uh, it, it started with the Abbasid Empire and then moved forward. So, so now we're in a situation where uh, the men who are uh, basically, and the most important point that I want to mention, again, there's a difference between what fiqah says and what is morally right. And this distinction I think I've already made. But uh, according to Islamic law, and then we can discuss this why, but there is no obligation whatsoever upon the wife towards the mother-in-law. There is no obligations. And in fact, the silence of it is so ironic because you can't think within the sharia of any, any relationship that's not discussed. Yes, there are higher principles. For example, the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever does not respect the elders, right? Uh, uh, whoever doesn't have uh, respect for the elders and mercy for the little ones, he's not amongst us. This is like a statement. Or for example, you can indirectly infer to the obligation the wife has by saying, well, the son has the obligation to the parents, and therefore, since the son is not able to do it, and the wife has to make the husband happy, therefore she is the one who has to fulfill the rights of the husband for, uh, for, for she has to do it her, she has to do it herself for her husband, for her husband to make her husband happy. And uh, so let me just, before I come to this issue, I wanted to mention one important rule that for young kids that are gonna go and join this new house is that of course there will be conflict. And in that sabr and patience and all those things are going to be required. The second is, is that um, when you are in this uh, relationship, and the reason the Sharia doesn't say anything is because women are, men, all men, okay, even like when a male becomes a Muslim, 
versus a female that becomes Muslim. The change from being non-Muslim to Muslim, you're essentially still the same. Okay? I mean, you change a lot, but you're, you're essentially, there's a lot of things that are still the same. But the change from being non-Muslim female to a Muslim female is very drastic. It's very significant. I mean, that same lady that was okay in wearing miniskirts is now shy. Right? And uh, so what happens is women vary very much from personality to personality. And you know how women are, they're picky about even who their friends are. Perhaps this is one of the reasons the Prophet ﷺ had to have ten wives at one time to be able to cater to the entire uh, female community of Medina. Because no one female can make, uh, can, it's not like a, a male can be friends and acquaintance with everyone. Women are generally very picky. And so the mother-in-law is a female, she's going to be picky. The wife is also a female, she's also going to be picky. They're going to be picky about their space. And see, the dynamics of it works like this, is that the, uh, there is a term they actually use in America, it's called mama's boy. Anybody ever heard of it? Mama's boy, okay. What happens is that uh, in-laws, this is one of the things that was pointed out amongst the, some of the people in, in amongst the fuqaha, amongst some of the fuqaha, they did point out that when two people get married, regardless, they have to be considered as adults. One of the problems that occurs is when people get married, the parents still treat them as, especially the in-laws, they still treat the daughter-in-law or the son-in-law as a child. And what that has an effect, as you will see, upon the relationship. Because remember what I said, if you make a mistake, if I make a mistake with my parents, my parents are going to forgive me two, three wet weeks. They're not going to even remember that I did something wrong. But if my wife does something wrong, then my parents are not going to forget that that easily. It's going to be hard. It's harder to forget what she did compared to what I did. This is just natural. And so what has to be kept in mind is that now one is the dynamics of the jealousy that's happening between sharing and uh, and and uh, and losing control the mother-in-law feeling she's losing control and the wife is sharing. This is one dynamics. The other dynamics happens when in-laws interfere into the marriage too much. The first thing that actually happens is that the wife starts to lose respect for her, her husband. Do you know why? Because she feels he's no longer in control of the marriage. He feels, she feels what? That he's not an adult. So one is, so even for the son, if he wants to like maintain his, you can say, his dignity with his wife, he has to be able to set limits around himself so that he can actually maintain uh, the, the ability to control his marriage. Because if the parents interfere too much, then the wife thinks, well, you know, he's a mama's boy. That's why I was referring to that. You know, he's, he's immature. He's not, he may be 30 years old, but he does everything his parents want, and then he loses respect with the parents. So, I made a link here between psychologically what happens and what the, some of the fuqaha have said, that these two people, they should be treated as what? As adults. So that's what the, the fuqaha have said, and then of course psychologically we can see this effect, that if the parents are interfering too much on either side, then the, uh, the, the spouses will feel like their marriage is not in their control and they'll blame the other spouse for losing that control, especially the husband. Uh, so that's one thing. So one thing that uh, psychologists have talked about, which is pretty interesting. So the point I was trying to make was, is that women are different from place to place, culture to culture, and they're very picky about the friends that they make. That also means the chances of conflict amongst women are higher. It also means that you can't have, and this is the reason the Sharia doesn't have a set of rules, is with women in that situation, you can't have a set of rules. It really has to be case by case. So the best, like the best Islamic approach, of course, is the wife's right. The wife and the fuqaha are very clear about this. Because the wife has no obligation to the in-laws, but she does have the right to her privacy. 
She has the right to her privacy. In fact, the fuqaha have gone as far as saying she should have her own kitchen supplies. And, and it was interesting that they were mentioning this because I think I um, either heard somewhere or read somewhere that, you know, when, when a wife moves to a house, she likes to be like the queen. She wants to be, she wants to feel like this is my house. She wants to feel like I'm the queen of the kitchen. Okay? And so this is uh, how women are in terms of their personality. So the best scenario in the case of, for example, um, the best scenario that, that when you look at the, the, the adab plus the sharia and all the, the, the dynamics, what you find is that the couples should be willing to try. They should be what? Willing to try to make it work together, meaning with the parents and the children, if they're nearby, if they're in the same city or if they can. The best is if they can make it work. But because the wife has the right of saying, well, you know, I'm not happy here, and because she has the right of her private space, and because she has the right to, uh, to, to, her, uh, to, her, uh, to feeling the sense of her sense of belonging, she has a right of, of this according to the fuqaha, and the, the husband has to provide her a place to stay, a place with all, all these, where she feels that this is her domain, not somebody else's shared domain. Um, because of this, the best in terms of adab is that they try, the husband and wife try to make it work with the parents. But if it doesn't, then they should be ready to, uh, to, to, to separate. And this is what happened between Fatima and Ali and the Prophet ﷺ, even though that's on the other, the reverse side, meaning the, it was the Prophet's daughter, not the other way around. So let me just... Um, so... So does the wife have to take care of the parents and obey the parents other than the general premises? And the other thing is, what is the status of the in-laws? What is the status? Are they just elders that you have to respect? As I mentioned, the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, that, uh, you know, the, the, the one who doesn't respect the elders and have mercy upon the kids, he's not amongst us. Is their status just as adults, uh, as elders of society? Or they have some other... The, they're related, they're, what we can say for sure within the Sharia is that they become relatives. So they have all the rights that are due upon the relatives in general. And that, and then, uh, that also has specific things which I'm not going to come to right now. But what I want to answer is this. Is that, so as far as living together, because the personalities of the mother-in-law is very variant, and because the personality of the wife is also very variant, you can't make a hard and fast rule, which is what the Sharia did. It didn't make a hard and fast rule. In terms of Islamic ethics and manners, yes, it's best if it works out, but the husband should realize that, okay, it's not going to work out, and rather than creating more facade by putting something together that's not going to work, it may be better to just uh, have it separate. And in fact, the, some of the fuqaha have gone to this point of saying, if the in-laws are abusive to the, if the in-laws are abusive to the daughter-in-law, then what? Like I mentioned in the very beginning, the adab are to do sabr. The adab are in Allah ya'murukum bil adli wa ihsan wa ita is al-qurwa. This is the adab. But she has the right. If she is being abused by the in-laws and she feels she is being abused by the in-laws, not to uh, not to uh, to keep a, you could say a distance from them, not to break the conversation, not to break the relationship. No, not to do uh, you know qatil sulat al No, but like keep her distance because she doesn't want the conflict. She can do this according to the Sharia rules. She can do this. Now we come to the next uh, aspect of this, which is that. Uh, what do you do in today's situation where the husband is working all the time and he has no ability to really be there for his parents and the only one who can possibly be there for his parents are his wife. So I thought about this and I may have come to a, a decision that may not be right, it may be right, Allah but I'm going to give you what I think about this. Um, oh, but before... Uh, Okay, I will come back to this point that I wanted to mention. The, the, the rule here is that we are living, in terms of if you want to know about the society that we're living in, 
the society that we're living in is a society that requires two adults to work for family. That's just how this society is. So if the wife is not working, then that is actually, even though, you got to remember that we're living in two different environments. One is what Islam would like. One is the Islamic environment, but we're not living in an Islamic environment. We're living in an environment that requires a two-parent uh, income household. So if the wife is not working, she owes a favor to the husband to be put in that situation where she is not working. That favor to the husband is now a credit because the system requires. Now, this is separate. What if both the parents are working? This is also very common now, where the husband is working and the wife is also working. So we'll talk about that. But I want to look at this scenario, that in this system, it is a, you can say, a luxury. It is a luxury to be not working. And so this is a credit on behalf, uh, from the husband to the wife. Islamically, of course we understand the wife doesn't have to work. But what happens practically? Because we live in a society where husband and wife both have to work, now the wife can't say, well, I don't care about the rent and I don't care about our medical insurance and I'm not going to work because I don't have to work according to Islam. No, what will she do? She will work. If she sees that the, 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 that they are short as a, family, as a family, they're short on the finances, she's going to work. And this would be the case of anybody, regardless. In this environment, if people, if the husband stops, starts to fall short on his income, the wife or other family members are going to either have to downgrade their lifestyle, or the wife is going to have to start uh, sharing the responsibilities of the finances. So, like for example in New York, the average two people, uh, the average income, in ho household income in New York, is by uh, is two two uh, two people are doing it, and the average income is approximately a little bit more than it used to be a little bit more than forty something. I don't know what it is now. This is when I saw the stats. So the point is, we live in a system that requires two people to work, and in that system, even though in in an Islamic system, she would not be required to work, but in this system, she is actually expected to work within this system. And so the, the Muslim wives who are not working need to understand that this is a benefit that they have because their husbands are Muslims. So this is one thing. Second, uh, so now because she owes her husband this favor, she has free time because the husband is the, the sole provider of the house. Now it could be the husband says, okay, I'll work half the time. Now you work the other half of the time and I'm going to help my parents. So nobody wants that situation. So in that sense, because of being in this system, and because the husband is no longer in a situation where he can help his, his parents, because Saturday and Sunday comes, you spend it with your uh, family. The other thing that needs to be done, it's not just money, it's also time. And what I was talking about, sharing the husband, that's because when you look at the long-term effects of this, is that if the parents are nearby, if they're in the same area, let's say Chicagoland area, then there should be some time in the Saturday, Sunday, where a husband is not just spending time with the family, the wife and the kids, but he's also spending time with his parents. And it shouldn't be like, you know, I'm going to see my Christmas on Turkey and Christmas and New Year Eves and something like that. He, he, he needs to somehow allocate uh, time for his parents, especially as they get older. This is something that is very clear within uh, Islamic ethics. Okay. The second thing here is that what happens, so what's the other possibility here? Uh, as I'm looking at the situation, so if the, if the husband is doing what Islam allows, which is that the husband has to give an, uh, an allowance to his wife, an allowance to his wife, so let's say he gives his wife $1,000 a month, $500 a month, whatever, and he's not able to take care of his parents, and in this situation where because of his work, the wife is not working, but he is working, he can use that some of the money that he's allocating to his wife to pay for somebody to somebody to either help if there's need, help needed, or uh, he can use that money to somehow allocate to helping his parents, whether it's another uh, sibling or whether it is uh, somebody who comes to clean the house, whatever it is, he can uh, also uh, help his parents by 
taking away from the allowance of the, of the allowances that he has set for his wife. So that way there's time and then there's the money that's per month given to her. So that's the second thing. The third thing is what happens if the husband is working and as would be normally the case, then the wife is also working. And so they both only have Saturdays and Sundays left. And uh, so that they have to just do the best that they can. But if both the wife and the husband are working, then Islamically now, not the system-wise. System-wise, she's doing what she has to do. But now she owes the husband. She owes the uh, the husband owes her a favor because she's not required to work Islamically. So if she is working Islamically, right? So I mean, if she's working to help her husband and uh, fulfill his obligations Islamically, so now Islamically he owes her the favor. So in that case it becomes even more difficult to ask the wife to, uh, to, to help my parents. She may. I mean, of course, one thing is very clear. Anyone who helps anyone, and particularly anyone who helps relatives, and particularly if a wife, to please her husband, helps her parents. And this is another thing I wanted to mention. Because marriage is an ibadah, and you know, uh, this is especially what I would like to say to the sisters, that because the Prophet said if the husband is happy, Right? Then what? She will get to go and look at this dichotomy the Sharia has. It's very interesting. What the Prophet said and what the Fuqaha say. So the Prophet said if she makes her husband happy, she will get to go to Jannah from any door she likes. She'll get to go to Jannah from any door she likes. So she's not, do if this is in her mind, I'm not doing this for my husband. I'm not doing this because he, he, he's taken away my rights. I'm doing this because I want that Jannah. I'm making him happy because for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is the highest. Uh, type of attitude that one could have. But, uh, but look at, now this is what the Prophet said, a, a wife whose husband is happy with her gets to enter Jannah from any door. But what did the Fuqaha say? This is, this is who Imam Abu Hanifa, I'm talking about Imam Abu Hanifa, he doesn't have, she doesn't have to cook for him. She's not obligated to cook for him. This is Abu Hanifa. She's not obligated to do anything for her husband other than the word nikah. Having intimacy with her husband. Who is this? This is the Hanafi fiqh. Imam Shafi is a little bit more strict than uh, Imam Abu Hanifa, but again, they're, they're, they're not looking at the ihsan aspect of things. They're looking at the bare minimum of the, uh, of the rights and obligations. And so, uh, what happens if uh, they're both working? Then the husband actually owes his wife, in addition to his responsibilities to his parents. Because she's doing, she is doing what the system requires, but Islamically, now she's helping her husband in his obligation. In the first case, she has no obligation to help her husband in the financial sector. And because she's in a system that gives her leisure, she has leisure, and, and so because of that, she now owes him, and he can use that, uh, request that be to be used uh, as a favor towards his parents. Now, then the second issue that I brought was the issue of allowance. Or it doesn't even have to be the allowance, it could be just the money that the, the, the family has. Some of it should go to the parents at one level. And no one is asked in regards to the parents to do illa mastata'atum, except what you can do, what is your ability. If you can't do anything, then you can't do anything. If you can do a lot, you can do a lot. If you can do... Uh, to, uh, 20% do 20%, 50%, 50%. This is why it's very important to actually be near your parents. Because the farther they are, then the more it becomes about how much money you're going to spend, uh, rather than how much time you'll spend and be able to serve them. And it seems from the Qur'an at least, uh, that it's not the money that the Qur'an is interested in. It's not the amount of money you're spending, but it's the amount of service that is being rendered. Uh, so, here's some thoughts that I had about the issue of, uh, of, of the rights of the in-laws. Of course, uh, if she wants to make her husband happy and the husband is a good son, then he will want that his parents are taken for, get care of. But then again, that has to do with what? It has to do with, is the personality of my wife going to mix in with the personality of my mother? Or are these two women, uh, their personalities don't just seem to mix at all? So this is the things that he's going to have to weigh and balance. My advice is uh, that as much as possible, we should try 
we should give it a try if it works or not. But then by the time they separate, the problem is there's so much of that blood. Because when they were trying and trying and trying and it didn't work out, and if you're living with your parents and then you say to your parents, well, I'm not going to live with you anymore, that doesn't look very good. So it has to be talked about very tactfully. Uh, and limits have to be set. And that, So let me come into some of the uh, uh, other aspects of the in-laws. The rule of thumb is that the husband should deal with his parents and the wife should deal with her parents unless they have been directly approached. So for example, if my parents want something, they shouldn't, they generally they shouldn't go to my wife, they should deal with me. Because I need to, as a husband, be able to put boundaries where I am in charge of my family. So they need to come to me, and with her, they need to come to her. And husband and wife, then do shura with each other, and then they, they come to an understanding together after taking shura, okay, these are our limits. For example, something very simple, I saw a, a conflict between a husband and wife about a year ago on this issue about how much the grandparents, they get to spend time with the child. So there was a fa grandfather, a father, a grandfather. You know, it's the job of grandfathers to spoil kids. But there, this sister, she was a convert, and she wasn't comfortable with her in-laws coming over to the house and taking the kid for five, six, seven hours. The grandparents, you know, you know how it is in the Desi culture. She wasn't comfortable with that. So there was this uh, conflict between the husband and wife. That you know, the grandparents they come and they take our child and. Uh, she was terrified when she heard about the shaving of the head, the aqiqa. She, you know, she's a white convert, and she hears they're going to shave. You know, they're going to put razors on his head, and you know, like some sort of cult. Uh, and she was very terrified, and and so the point is, is that you know, he's trying to make his ha his parents happy. He doesn't see a problem with. So what? You know, the, my son's with my father. What's the big deal? Or my son's with my uh, mother. What's the big deal? But. But she feels like her child is being taken away from her. And uh, so, so this, these things need to be sorted out uh, in some intelligent way. And, uh, and so the rule of thumb is, let the husband deal with his parents, let the wife deal with her parents. Unless, for example, if my mother goes directly to my wife, then it's between you and two. Don't involve me. Now you two got involved, don't involve me. Right? So that's your relationship. I mean, Unless there's a conflict, don't involve me. And uh, the good quality of a moment is he doesn't involve himself. And I, I'm shocked, actually, to see how much the Prophet was not involved in, in the marriages of his, his, his daughters, in terms of not before, but afterwards. He was completely not involved. Even to the point, for example, if he heard that Uthman and his wife are in an argument, he didn't care. He didn't get involved. He didn't get upset. He didn't, you know, like the Prophet once, like for example, I'm sure you all heard of this story, but uh, just uh, to like share with you, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example. Think of yourself as, uh, think of your daughters and they're married off. And think of these two situations. I'll give one from Ali and one from Uthman. And think what your reaction would be compared to what the Prophet's reaction was. So, a man comes to the Prophet says, I have no money, I need money. The Prophet says, okay, go to Uthman. Okay. So he goes and knocks on the door of Uthman. While he's doing this, he hears Uthman arguing with his wife, Uqayya, the daughter of the Prophet وسلم, about conserving money, about not using money, not being extravagant. And he's arguing with her. Right? And so he's like, <laughs> you know, this guy's going to give me money, he's not going to give me anything. So he starts going back and then, you know, Uthman opens, he says, what do you want? He's like, well, the Prophet sent me here that you're going to give me money, but I can see there are obviously issues here. And he gave him a bag of gold. Now, he goes and, you know, he tells the Prophet this. The Prophet didn't say, oh, Uthman and Khaya, they were fighting? What was the fighting about? What were they fighting about? Right? Wouldn't it be interesting? I mean, that would be the natural thing. And the Prophet knew if, they have, if, if it goes to a certain level, he'll get involved. Right? And so, in fact, this happened between the Prophet and Aisha and Abu Bakr. When the Prophet and when the, when the, um, so I'll talk about that in a second. But another example is, look at now Ali. Ali was extremely poor. This is well known. He was extremely poor. He saw his daughter's poverty. 
He knew that she suffered from a young age. The, I, Fatima was growing up at the time where the, all the Muslims were going through the persecution. And she's, you know, she, she saw her mom die. She saw her father suffering. Right? She, she's had this very tragic life, actually. Fatima's life, really alone, right? is very tragic. And, and, and then, you know, and then now uh, she's finally married, but she's, they constantly have financial issues. Right? They're not eating for three days, they're not eating for two days, and Hassan is crying, and Hussein is crying, and their younger child at that time, uh, Mohsen, is crying, and uh, uh, Mohsen passed away. And uh, so the, his children don't have food, and you know, the Prophet knows about this, right? And the Prophet is quiet. He's not, it's their marriage. Let them deal with it. He treated them as they would, as the Fuqaha have said, like adults, right? And so, uh, and then, you know, let me give you one example of the Prophet with his in-laws, is, you know, when there was a time, the Prophet and Aisha are arguing, and, uh, and Aisha says to the Prophet, you said this. And the Prophet said, I didn't say that. No, no, you said this. I'm sure you've all heard of this type of, uh, no, no, tum ne 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 So the Prophet said, okay, fine, we'll make Abu Bakr our judge. We'll make Abu Bakr our judge. He, he can judge, you tell him your case, I'll tell him my case. Let him decide what the reality is. Anyway, so they went to Abu Bakr, just to make the long story short, they went to Abu Bakr. And when she told Abu Bakr, me and the Prophet had a conflict, and he said this, and he says he doesn't say this, you can imagine Abu Bakr got upset and angry, right? So that like finished the whole thing there, because now Fatima was seeking protection from the Prophet against her father, who wanted to, you know, give her a, a good smack. <laughs> so, um, so... And the Qur'an also mentions what? When there is a conflict, you know, if you, if, remember the three stages mentioned in Sultan Nisa, first you warn them and then you separate your friends, and then what? Then you bring somebody from their family and somebody from your family. So the, so the in-laws are also there that when the conflict goes out of hands, then they are the ones that are supposed to solve the conflict. So rather than being the instigators, and in-laws, both sides of the in-laws need to be extremely cautious because I think in-laws don't realize how much they... And in fact, you know, I did a survey before I came here. I texted a group of sisters. I said, what's one advice you would give your in-laws? So I sent these random text messages. I can show them to you, a few of them at least, in my pocket. Uh, I sent these random text messages to a group of sisters saying, what's one advice you would give your in-laws? Every single sister gave the same response. Don't get involved in our business. Don't get involved in our business was the, was the single most, this is the only response I got was don't get involved in our business. And so it's important for the son to maintain the fact that he's in control as the head of the family. And it is important also that uh, the wife doesn't feel that her personal space. So even if the husband, the main thing is this, is that the wife has to have a sense of what personal space, where she can make her own food for her own family, for her own kids, where she's dealing. So as long as we can make architectures of houses, of spaces, where husbands and wives, uh, hus parents, husbands and wives have their personal space and the parents can live together, if that can be done, then that's quite ideal. Let's say the parents live upstairs and the couple lives downstairs and they have two different kitchens. As long as the husband provides a space where she feels it's her space and no one else can just interfere. Like I mentioned, the fuqaha have talked about that the mother-in-law cannot come into the house and just start moving furniture here and there because this is her, this is her space. And so, um, so, uh, so th there's no general rule, no general rule can be made because of the, the problem of personalities and, and, and uh, the, the, the expectations and the value systems that they have. And so, the decision of living with parents or not living with parents, or how you live with the parents, and what is personal space, and how much personal space she needs to feel like she has personal space, will all be judged based upon case by case. Um, and uh, then, uh, the other thing is, of course, before you get married, and this is very general, you have to see into things like, if he's the only son, then there's definitely going to be issues where the, hus where the husband is going to feel like he owes the parents, especially if he's a good Muslim. And so these things need to be looked at. Um, and a lot of times when people get married and they talk about these issues, like uh, we're going to live together with our parents, 
And in fact, this happened with me. Uh, I, I, before we got married, I said, you know, we're going to live with our parents and so on and so forth. And everyone says, yeah, 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 I'll do this and I'll do this and I'll do this and I'll do this and I'll do this. But when it comes to actually doing it, it's not that easy. Right? When, you, when, when my wife gets to know my mother, uh, then, you know, then it's real. It's not just a theoretical thing. It's two different personalities, two different minds, and uh, uh, my wife is sensitive, my mom is sensitive, both of them are sensitive, so now what are you going to do? So, uh, so these are some of the issues that... Uh, so the best uh, thing that I've... out of everything that I read was, somehow if it can be, let's try to do it, and the option should be open, that if we can't make it work, then we can then separate as the Sharia allows the wife that right to, to have her personal space. But we can try to make it work together first. Or you live separately and then you come together. Uh, Allah Ma'ala, which one is better? I don't know which one of the two is better. Um, some of the other points that I wanted to mention in terms of the... Uh, is that... Uh, Yes, between the in-laws and the child, meaning the husband or the wife, there should always be some sense of formalities, meaning it shouldn't become completely informal. Even if the family is very joyous and mazakia and doing comedy all the time and very entertaining and they're very, you know, gulbil jana, just like we say, right? Still, the, uh, the, the, the one that... Like if I'm going to my in-laws or my wife is in with my parents, uh, there should always be a sense of formality because uh, her parents are going to be judging me all the time, just as my parents are judging her all the time. So this small, again this is case by case, but the general rule should be that when you're with the in-laws, and this is why it becomes a problem because generally wives are more formal with their in-laws. Right, uh, and they can't, and then they don't feel like they have their personal space. So, uh, but uh, generally, also, uh, besides the fact that the women naturally tend to do this, but even the men, when they deal with their in-laws, they should have a sense of there is, you know, some like uh, distance, form, formality. You, you, you're going through the formalities of of being an in, in-law. And so, these were some of the uh, thoughts that I had gathered uh, and come across for a while. Um, the only thing I didn't emphasize that I read a lot about is that setting limits. What I mean by that is that, of course, uh, the wife in that particular situation, she, she need, the wife and the husband need to set limits of how they'll deal with the in-laws. They need to have shura together, they need to have discussions, they need to talk about these things and come up with a common... You know, just like with, with kids we say, the mom and the dad, they have to be in the same page. Right? So that they can't be manipulated by the kids. So if the father says no candy, the mother needs to say no candy. That way none of the kids can manipulate the parents. In the same way, so that the kids don't get manipulated in the same way, that meaning the husband and the wife don't get manipulated, they need to be on the same page so that they're saying the same thing to the parents so that it's very clear to the parents what the limits are. Because anytime you're in a relationship, in any relationship, every relationship tries to see where my boundaries are, right? Every kid will fight and see, okay, if I can go two inches farther, three inches farther, how much farther can I break uh, until my dad is extremely angry and I can't go any further. So in the same way, parents are also going to try to in, intervene and in crouch and try to see okay how far can we go in intruding their space and molding them to what we want and then you know parents will give advice you should live here you should do this job you should you know so many things will happen so the husband and the wife they need to be on the same page so that uh, no matter what happens they, they it's their life and they have that sense of it's their life um, and it's in their control so I, I just had these things to say for today and أقول قولي هذا أستغفر الله لي ولكم ونساء المسلمين والمسلمات So if there's any questions I'll be happy to answer